Also, like the shoes, um, she says, like, oh, the shoes will give you protection. And then th there's like a lot of implications about the shoes, which I like because it really like, lets your imagination go wild. Like, thinking these shoes are really powerful. She needs these shoes. She says, I'm the only one who knows how to use these shoes. They're no good to you. So the shoes must be able to do more than, um, like, kind of give you protection and send you home if you need to go home. But I like the fact that they never explore what these shoes actually do. And it's kind of, as a child, I always thought, oh, what, what would the shoes do? Like, are they like a magic wand? Can you like, are they destructive? Or like, I don't know. I, do, I always think about what the shoes are actually capable of. Yeah, that's sort of, um, that, can, that can be its own subject, really, the ruby slippers, because I always wonder what exactly they're capable of because <laughs> I love the fact they don't come out and say it because it it gives that mystique, it makes it more magical, but also kind of more eerie just looking at them, wondering what exactly it is they're capable of because it's almost as if they have their own kind of sentience almost vaguely because when the witch tries to take them off, she just can't do it and just her hands yeah. get like zapped. I think the witch, she sort of acts as if she's been burned on her hand a little bit. Like if you touched a stove while it was on. And it makes <laughs> me wonder, does the, sh do the shoes just protect whoever wears them? Or do they decide who they want to belong to? Well, I think this another thing is in like films now, I feel like the, they always have the need to over explain everything because of like people writing in their opinions online. And like. Oh, yeah. Um, the, there was a time when those things weren't needed. Like, I feel like a good example was the new live action Beauty and the Beast, and there was like a whole thing about, oh, the town forgot that there was a prince in the woods because it was part of the curse. And I was like, but like, obviously, there's been people like trolls on the internet and stuff who have brought that up in the past, but at its core, it's not really important. And it's just, like part of your imagination just like let it go but you maybe we'll have like a whole um dialogue or like description of what the shoes can do in a new film i don't know <laughs> well we, we probably will it wouldn't shock me um another thing like what you mentioned first of all about the whole plow hole thing i think that's just another example of how we've gotten more jaded and cynical because yeah. Film criticism has just devolved into, oh, there's this plot hole that doesn't make sense. Let me make a snarky comment about it. I don't mm. know if you've ever heard of, uh, if you've ever heard of Cinema Sins. Yes, yeah, definitely. It's these video. Like, for anyone who, do, who doesn't know, these videos that uh, sort of point out any any tiny plot hole that's in a movie. It's kind of under the guise of satire, but it, it doesn't seem like it is most of the time. Yeah. So that whole internet culture, that, that internet critic culture, like that or kind of the, the nostalgia critic or something, there's this whole culture now where we just obsess over plot holes, and now these movies over-explain stuff that doesn't need to explain. And then yeah. their attempt to make it completely foolproof they just make it very convoluted and make less sense yes yeah definitely and it's good to have a script that is as close to airtight as you can get and to make sure everything makes sense because even in a story that is fantasy it's good to have stuff make sense so you can be invested in whatever happens yeah. but a lot of these plot holes are just really, they don't matter most of the time. It's usually, it, it has nothing to do with the quality of the story. Just pointing out logical fallacies in these movies that are complete fantasy. I just think it seems really ridiculous. It's not criticizing anything about the story or anything that's actually important. Yeah, it's not. It's Yeah, and it's ridiculous. And it's, a shame to see like films try and cater to that now, but uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll get tired of it and we'll go back to doing more stuff that like lets people use their imagination a little bit more. 
but and speaking of that i always used to wonder like um when he they were like oh sorry <laughs> the tin man when they meet the tin man and they're like how did you get here and he said oh i was chopping down a tree and i i just started rusting because it was raining or snowing or something um i always wondered like oh who how did you get there where does he live like how long has he been there and stuff i didn't really because he didn't really explain that he was once a human but again i kind of liked not knowing because it just leaves your imagination to go wild it works in the book i think because of how his character is and it gives him that motivation and in a book it's a lot less awkward to stop and explain something like that but if in the movie they just stopped and he just gave this whole backstory <laughs> completely in the flow they were giving it just would not work it's another really good example of show don't tell and don't have over explain every little detail and give us that mystery and it kind of gives you yeah. it makes you more immersed yeah. in the fantasy and it's more everlasting as a result mm, definitely and i think these plot holes people point out for example the glinda thing we kind of provided something that could be a logical explanation for that another thing they point out is oh why didn't the witch just kill dorothy immediately and i think it's i just think those sort of plot holes where it asks why a character doesn't do a certain thing to be ridiculous because in real life humans behave in very odd ways and we don't always do the most obvious thing yes. we sort of relish and stuff and we don't really always do what we set out to do or just even in general we just do bizarre things sometimes so i think when any plot hole is asking oh why why wouldn't this character do this it just doesn't <laughs> really make sense to me because humans themselves are kind of a bundle of hypocrisy. Next, we go to Tin Man, and the whole sequence of Tin Man's forests. I think the talking trees are pretty interesting because, again, Oz in some ways is very wholesome and happy, but there's these trees that are just horribly grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, they just like stand around all day, just being grumpy. I think it's sort of like the antithesis of something like Toy Story because th those are objects come to life. Well, I guess a tree is already alive, but you know, it gets sentience. And yeah. the toys, they want to be played with. That's like their goal. And they're, they're happy when they're used for what they're made for. But these trees are not happy when they're <laughs> used for what they're sort of for. <laughs> they're very against it. Yeah sure like that um the makeup again was good really on the trees for the time and stuff like to think there's like a whole person and that scene's not like really pivotal and it's just nice to think like so much time and effort went into those costumes for a tree those two people playing trees <laughs> oh yeah i mean i think it's really impressive that so many people especially back then were so dedicated to pulling off this effect and yeah. it wasn't even very important to the story it could have been cut out completely yeah. but they spent so much time in it. Like it for the time it looked really good yeah another thing i i've noticed watching this time with the tin man is it seems as though uh they're actually squaring oil onto his face which you wouldn't think is that like needed but it looks like oil's going all over his face when they're squirting oil on him and like and his shoes and stuff um which i thought was kind of a nice touch but it's just funny looking back because if it was done today no no one would actually use real oil <laughs> oh that reminds me that they shot that entire scene but they had to redo it because tin man wasn't dirty enough oh <laughs> which back then doing all that makeup again putting up all that time that would have been torture, especially for Jack Haley, knowing you were in that costume, and now you have to do it all over again, just oh. because that one detail wasn't right. And nowadays, you, you could go back and you could do that in post, but it, but it just shows how 
like just the grit, the sheer grit of movie making back then was just so different. Yeah. Before uh, they find Tin Man, I think another really good example of Scarecrow being a good character is how he has he has the idea of Dorothy uh, to mock them so they'll throw the apple so they can in turn eat them. And in the book, we have all those moments where the characters show that they have all these emotions, but in the movie, they don't do that as much as Scarecrow showing off that they already have what they want. I think Scarecrow does it a lot more than the, the others do in this movie. I did notice that as well this time, something I picked up on, because throughout the film, there's little bits of him actually thinking of how best to approach a subject or to tackle a problem um, or help people out. But there isn't any like actual examples of the line showing actual courage and the Tin Man showing heart, I don't feel. And even at the end, I thought, um when they go to i think they talk the lion into like no we need to go and rescue dorothy and he's like okay yeah i'll do it for dorothy and i was like oh this is his moment of showing courage but even then he tries to run away like and it's played for a laugh but, yeah and tin man um even even his own acts the the thing that makes him so useful scarecrow is the one that is like okay give me that axe i gotta use it to fight off these guards like, like the other two are almost useless in this movie to be honest yeah it's weird I mean, it just it did feel obvious this time but i not really noticed it before um yeah strange so then we move on to, to tin man in comparison to scarecrow tin man i think I, I think for starters before we even unpack his whole character and his whole personality i think jack haley did a really good job of just selling how torturous it would be to just stand there motionless, not being able to talk and the way he kind of squeaks out his words, just, it seems really, it seems like he's like genuinely in pain and in just complete torture and agony standing there for so long. And I think a lot of actors could have made that look really hokey. Yeah, he does sell it. I when he's introduced, he almost, it does look like a statue, I feel like, almost like it's a, it is a little statue. Um, it, yeah, he sells it really well. I think the Tin Man's design is just really creative looking and really appealing. Um, I do kind of prefer how he looks in the book because he looks, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's less human, but it's a way I don't think they could have replicated in live action at this, at this point. But yeah, there's just a certain way like I've seen like statues and like theme park stuff people have recreated of the tin man and he has he has this very just interesting look about him that sort of if you just saw him motionless that that looks sort of it, it looks really cool but there's also this like haunting sort of nature to just the way he just sort of stands there yeah i i think obviously for the time and like based on the book this is a really really good look but in terms of like now and so many oz adaptions the tin man's design well also all of the designs kind of i get bored of seeing that same silhouette of like a, a round drum for his torso and then like legs and he usually has like um like a funnel on his head and stuff and i I don't know how else I would do a tin man, but if if the assignment is to draw a man made out of tin, I feel like there's loads of ways that you could go with that. And um, maybe it's, again, how influential this film is, but everybody always seems to go with a similar look to the tin man in this film. And it, and it kind of, I mean, I like it in this film, but it, it kind of annoys me now. Um, it, uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah see what they do with a new film but i don't think they would deviate too far from this kind of look yeah because i think they're really going to need to sell the whole oh it's the wizard of oz you know what this is so i don't know if they'll stray too far the only tin man i've seen that has strayed super far there's this video game i think it is or maybe it's a comic book or maybe it's both but the yeah. tin man is just huge he's like giant and like super fat Oh, okay. He's like he looks like some kind of murder robot. Right, okay. 
And I think yeah, that's an interesting take to, to go with. Yeah, he has this sort of like steam, like this sort of steampunk look to him, and I think that's a that's a good that's a good direction to go in because I think Tin Man, out of all the characters, has the most f- creative freedom to look really cool and interesting. And I think with Oz, it would be cool with, with new depictions to do something else with the whole man made out of tin thing because I think there's so many more directions they could go with instead of just doing the same thing. Because if you want to be, if you want to capture the spirit of the original in a way, you you have to kind of deviate because otherwise you won't capture that same feeling of wonder and excitement of the newness and the weirdness. Yeah, definitely. I I would say that um, his little number and his little dance is one that sticks out. I think just because my dad always liked it and he would like always into um, like copy. Him, like copy the little dance that he does and he my dad was always really amazed with like how the trick that they do where he's like almost falling over but never falls over um and the bit at the end when like the smoke comes out of his little spout <laughs> so i feel probably how much you feel towards scarecrow's dance and his number i not that the tin man's my favorite character but i really like this little dance and this like the charade, the charades that he's doing. Oh yeah, um, I think that whole lean he does is really cool. Just the whole dance itself, it's kind of it has this sort of gracefulness to it because it's all technically done on accident, and they do a really good job of making it seem like it's accidentally cool. Yeah, they don't make it seem like Tin Man is trying to look cool or is trying to dance. They just they do a really good job of making it seem not really supposed to be choreography, but it is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's a fun. It's just like a fun little sequence, and it's nice to see. Like again, I guess it's showing them uh, Dorothy and Scarecrow bonding, like them just observing him doing his little dance and like whispering to each other's ear, like we'll take him with us. Like we could help him. Um, I guess it reinforces that thing of them being a team and being closer than the others. Oh yeah, for sure. I think that little moment just kind of solidifies. They have kind of like that energy of maybe someone you've been friends with since kindergarten, and <laughs> you'll you'll have this whole big friend group that you get, but you you still kind of have the most intimacy and the most bond with the friend you started out with, kind of. Yeah. Sure. You don't really get moments where she's talking about Scarecrow to Tin Man or Lion or any, anything yeah. like that, really. Yeah. As far as Tin Man's personality goes, um, I think, I don't know, he doesn't seem as developed as Scarecrow. I mean, he he does show moments of empathy and the fact that he's sensitive because he'll cry a few times but other than that there's just not a whole lot to him i don't guess yeah i I suppose maybe it's like especially for the time maybe it was like easier to um show examples of using your brain or your intellect other than using your emotions um but yeah it just (laughs) Yeah, he cries a little bit. He he doesn't have that much of a. I wouldn't describe him as a, like a warm person, which he should be. <laughs> should be the most. Out yeah, there. he doesn't really. I think that's one of my main kind of problems. I guess is he doesn't necessarily seem warm. Maybe it's because I can, I know Jack Haley didn't like doing the movie, so maybe that maybe that's why I view him like that. I mean, it's yeah. still a really good performance yeah. that seems earnest. But he doesn't seem as warm as I would imagine Tin Man while reading the book. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, despite my liking the book design more, I do think they did a really good job with the, the makeup on him, though. It looks really painful to get on there. It was, I imagine it was probably the most uncomfortable out of all the costumes, probably. They like all the costumes. 
panel making with the, those three it's just like amazing to think and they really really had to use their brains and like innovation to to think of ways to produce something that looked like that because when would they need before that somebody to look like a lion or a scarecrow or like whereas now it's another thing that's like it's a shame to see with films now it's just so easy to cgi things or um add little bits in post and back then you really had to think outside the box to achieve something that looked realistic but looked really well and i i think it it holds up still today that makeup and the way that they all look it doesn't look like tacky or like embarrassing it just looks really nice yeah and it easily could have been something that just you look at today and it's hilarious and it just gets memed it gets memed back and forth but holds up it's not like something you would watch and just oh this is a laughing stock it still looks really good it looks it's aged a lot better than some cgi really yeah definitely 